Prayer is a very important matter. I don't know how a person walks in the straight and narrow way that is set out in the Bible and leaves prayer out. It is a integral, necessary part of walking in the straight and narrow way. The idea of a straight and narrow way means that you just cannot haphazardly enter it or journey down it. I think I've mentioned many times that we don't use the word today, S-T-R-A-I-T. We use S-T-R-A-I-G-H-T, but you can see in the King James Version, both words. The one we use today meant a straight line. The one that's not much used today, S-T-R-A-I-T, means a narrow, hemmed-in passage that you cannot just easily and without thought enter in. That it is, as far as the way to heaven, it's hemmed in on all sides by the authority of the gospel of Christ. <clears throat> and unless we're willing to submit to what the Lord has authorized us to do, or what He's explicitly forbidden us to do, leaving undone anything not authorized to, then you'll never get into the straight and narrow way. And if you do, and you become lax in your faithfulness, uh, you're out. Now, God's great mercy and His favor is extended to all men through the gospel. And for those who from the heart obey the gospel and their past sins are forgiven, and they're in the straight and narrow way, the Lord's church, the Lord adds people to the church, the people who believe and obey the gospel and are baptized into Christ, Galatians 3.27, then they're in a state of favor. They are God's favored people. Chosen people, yes, because they chose to hear and believe the gospel and submit to it. But favored in the sense that they're where all spiritual blessings and heavenly places are located, Ephesians 1 and verse 3. That means members of the church who are faithful have favors and blessings those outside the church or those who are unfaithful do not have. I think those of us who are striving to be what all the New Testament says a Christian is to be should rejoice in the exceeding great and precious promises that belong to faithful members of the church who are true Christians. And one of those things that is not only a blessing, certainly a blessing, and a privilege, and only members of the Lord's Church are faithful have it, is prayer. You'll notice, and we'll mention it later on, in the model prayer that Jesus gave, it begins by our Father. Now everybody can't say that truthfully. We're God's children in God's family. And 1 Timothy 3.15 says that family is the church. So we need to understand the Bible, as we sang about a while ago, regarding prayer, and that such a prayer as we now speak of is a privilege and a duty of every faithful member of the church. People who are not children of God can say our Father all day long, give me this, thank you for that, strengthen me here, and they will not be heard. As I say, and Ephesians 1, 3 is clear on this, there are certain things that are blessings from God that are reserved only for faithful members of the Lord's church. We shouldn't feel haughty about it. We shouldn't, as it were, have the wrong kind of pride about it. But we should be very thankful and we should utilize this privilege that we might stay in the straight and narrow way, that we might face the terrible things of life that to one extent or the other comes upon all of us. So it's one of the outstanding duties, privileges, and joys of the Christian life. It's the Father's desire, and it is His will manifest in His Word, the Bible, that we pray. Our English word pray actually means, without going through all the historicity of it and the historical background of it uh, simply means a petition. We have desires. We have 
wishes. We have times of great thanksgiving. We have times in which we are borne down with sorrow or pain. And we can go to our Heavenly Father as His faithful children, members of His family. And we can offer these petitions to Him. As to the regularity of prayer, we learn from Paul's writing to the Thessalonian brethren in 1 Thessalonians 5, verses 17 and 18, pray without ceasing. Now, he doesn't mean that you walk around muttering a prayer 24 hours a day. He means that it's a, a regular thing in your life. It is continual in your life. It is always in your life. It's a part of your spiritual breathing, as it were. Pray without ceasing. In everything give thanks. Have you thought about that for a minute? Have you thought of some of the terrible things that can come upon people? Some of it because you're Christian. Some of it because you're human being and subject to the frailties of being in the flesh. But it doesn't make a difference whether you're rejoicing because good things have happened. Are you hurting because of a disease? Or there's been some privation, maybe a death in the family? But the scripture says that we are to pray in everything. And in that prayer, we're to be thanking God. I think one of the easy ways to see this is to realize that when you have something bad happen to you, whatever that bad is, usually there's somebody else in a whole lot worse situation. Now, that's not being thankful he's in the worst situation you are. It's causing you to reflect deeply on your own life. And uh, we've got, got to get this little probably colloquial saying and somewhat redundant, but it's so true, used correctly. There, but for the grace of God, go I. When you think of the billions of people on this globe today, and where most of them are, what we call developing nations or third world countries, where many of them would just rejoice to have clean running water. And you think of the fact that there before the grace of God go I, may wake, want you to cause you to slow up before you get very critical, some people, because God permitted you to be born here. Why are you an American? I think I can say just about everybody in this room because the grace of Almighty God allowed you to be born into America. Now when it comes to being a Christian, by Him allowing you to be born here in America meant that then you had a greater opportunity to learn the gospel than about any other place in the world. Now just on those two things, how thankful should we be? And what obligation it lays upon us to use these freedoms that most of the world don't have and that God's grace bestowed upon us to live for the Lord. Pray without ceasing and everything give thanks. For this is the will of God in Christ Jesus to you. Now notice in Christ Jesus. Where do we say God located all spiritual blessings in heavenly places? In Christ Jesus. How do you get in to Christ Jesus? Galatians 3.27 gives you the only doorway into Christ. You're baptized into Christ. There's no other doorway. You, you, you never can believe into Christ, repent into Christ, or confess Christ's name into Christ. You'll never find the Bible teaching such a thing. If you've been told that all your life by everybody around you, Go back and see what God said about it. And let that settle the matter. When you believe, it's headed in the right direction. When you repent of your sins, that's headed in the right direction. When you confess your faith in Christ as the Son of God, that's all going in the right direction. But there's only one step that puts you into Christ. And that's to be immersed in water. By the authority of Jesus Christ. Into the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. For the remission of your past sins. 
That's being baptized into Christ. We have so many privileges that we take for granted. I don't mean that we deliberately ignore them. But they're so commonplace to what the New Testament defines to be a Christian. And we live in such a blessed land that it's so easy to let the little things that are not really little pass right by us. So let us take stock of what we thank God for. It's a privilege to use the words of the writer of Hebrews, Hebrews 4.16, to draw near with holiness under the throne of grace. Why? The throne of favor. Because we are favored people, then we should know what we have a right to do. That we may receive mercy and find grace to help. To help us in Christ in time of need. I said this morning toward the end of my sermon, it is a marvelous thing. Well, so many people can't do it. Most can't do it. To be able, before you drift off to sleep, to pillow your head, and to be able to say, Our Father, and lay your petitions before Him, sealing it in the name of Christ and an amen, with a not my will, but thine be done. And you've done all that anybody can do to secure yourself if you die during your sleep. You don't have to be concerned about anything. Not one thing. You've lived your one day as a time. As the Lord taught us his word to do. You've done what you could do. And if in taking inventory. You find you haven't. You have the power to repent. And to confess those sins before your father. And to pray for greater strength. To serve him if tomorrow should come. It gives us joy and satisfaction to know that the supplication of a righteous man availeth much in its working. James chapter 5 and verse 16. That makes me want to be sure I'm a righteous person. Well, a person's righteous that does righteousness and all of God's commands are righteousness. And the conclusion of the whole matter according to God is to fear of God and keep His commandments. Do you ever pray to be able to keep your priorities where they ought to be, well, there it is. Your whole life has one thing involved in it, to fear God and keep His commandments. If you can do that all the time, you'll pray like you ought to, won't you? You'll study your Bible like you ought to. You'll have the right attitude toward those lost in sin and in need of the gospel. You'll have the right viewpoint of your brothers and sisters in Christ. You'll be ready unto every good work as the Bible defines that work. You'll be changing your viewpoints and your attitude. You'll be able to see things like God sees them. And there's no other way you can do that. There's just no other way anybody can do that. God has the ability to answer prayer. That's a wonderful thing to know your prayers are answered. He may say no, yes, wait a while or give it to you in some other way. But after all, he's your creator. He knows all that's the object of knowledge. That is, he's omniscient. And he'll give you exactly what you need to help you be godly. One thing he's always got in mind that we had better have in mind. That life's a vapor and appears for a little while and then vanishes away. And it's appointed unto men once to die and after this the judgment. What a difference it would make if we were able to let those two principles of truth reign in our lives and all of our plans and purposings and all of our associations and all that we think about doing. Because you see, if we don't let it, it's still going to happen. And it's going to catch a whole lot of people off guard. Death to the person outside of Christ. To the person who lives for this present world. To the unfaithful child of God who does not want to confront sin in his own life. It's a horrible thing for that person to think about death. Because with death comes the end of the opportunity to serve God. And to keep his commandments. The opportunity to be saved from sin is long gone. There is no changing after death. Christ is the prime example of praying. Remember, he was a man as much as you or I am, that is, a human being, subject to like passions. And the fact that Christ spent much time in prayer and positive is, I think, very positive proof that Christians must be praying disciples. We're members of his spiritual body. 
We're talking about Christ in his fleshly body doing for us what we couldn't do for ourselves to save our souls. Note this. At the very beginning of our Lord's public ministry, immediately following his being baptized, the scripture records in Luke 3.21 that he prayed. Now I want to stop there and then go back further in his life. You remember that he grew in favor with God and man. You remember that he was raised by Joseph and his mother Mary. Remember God did not just haphazardly say, well, I'll just choose this couple to make any difference what Jewish couple I choose and put my son in their care. No, they, they were chosen because of who they were and the characters they were and their love for the truth. What does that mean? It means that from a child, he had been taught the law of Moses. He had been taught about prayer. His, his earthly father and his mother prayed with him. Remember, he never violated the law of Moses. And that means not only in dietary laws of, the Mo of Moses, but everything else, they saw that he did what God wanted him to do and there was no mistake made. Isn't that amazing? How would you live if God had put his son from a babe? from an infant, from birth, into your care. That's the kind of people Joseph and Mary were. They don't get, they don't get used enough for the greatness of, of them that God would choose them to rear His only begotten Son in the flesh, John 1, 14. On the night before our Lord selected the twelve, the scripture says he went out into the mountains to pray and he continued all night in prayer to God. Luke 6 verse 12. I think if you want to understand by example what an effectual fervent prayer is, there's a good example. Certainly he was a righteous man. And as a man, a sinless man, that's how much time he felt he needed to be talking to his father. In Matthew 14, 23, and after he had sent the multitudes away, he went up into the mountain apart to pray. And when even was come, he was there alone. Again, Matthew 14, 23. You know, there's some things that even a human child gets better said when they sit down with mama or daddy. Private conversations. And when it comes to our Heavenly Father, when it comes to knowing He knows all there is about me and whatever there is about me, He knows. He knows it flawlessly and completely and totally. Then you can talk to Him about anything. You can know He cares about you. By the very fact, he wants us to pray to him. He says he cares about us. And it's a privilege and a duty we have because we are Christians. And nobody else has that. So you can understand why one might be, want to be alone in order to talk about those things. In Mark 1.35, and in the morning, a great while before day, he rose up and went out and departed into a desert place and there prayed. Now, I know as well as you do, if you know your Bible, we should be able to pray where we are. We pray in this assembly. We pray before meals and so on. One should always be in a relationship with his heavenly Father. That's a saved relationship, a faithful relationship to where you can speak to God. So you should be able to pray anytime. But this is teaching there is a time when it comes to your in-depth personal being that you need to go be by yourself with God. And Jesus used the terminology of King James, enter into a closet. The idea is be by yourself. Just you and God. At the conclusion of Christ's parting message to the disciples, he lifted up his eyes toward heaven and, and he prayed. John 17. And shortly before the trying ordeal of his arrest and put into the hands of a terrible, cruel mob, you remember that he took Peter, James, and John and went into the garden of Gethsemane and prayed three times even when they couldn't stay awake to accompany him. Matthew 26, 36 through 44. His best friends on earth 
We're not there for him in his most trying time. And we're going to get worse in a few hours because or less because they're all going to forsake him. They're all going to forsake him. Now you think about it for a minute because we're all taught that if you live godly lives then you will suffer persecution to one extent or the other in one kind of another. And you may not have anybody of humankind to stand with you. But you know God will never forsake you. How far is God away from you when you're a righteous person? He's just right there with you. As close as it's possible for any being to be with you. You can always talk to Him. It may be that you're in a situation where all you can say is, Father, help. It may be that you don't know how to express your thoughts as you would, but you know God understands. God knows. Have you ever been in situations where you just were so burdened down you just didn't know how to articulate exactly what's on your mind? Well, if you haven't been... You just be faithful a little longer. It'll come. But God's right there. God's right there. And you have the assurance from His Word that He'll answer your prayer. Now it may come different from what you think. He'll answer your prayer. Let me draw back here now and say you can't live your life any way you want to and pray and God answer your prayer. Except that you confess sins you've committed having repented of them and he'll answer it in forgiving you and then you can continue down the straight and narrow way we talked about early on. But you are assured, the Apostle John in 1 John does that, that he will answer our prayers. He will answer them with our own best interest at heart. And who could know what's best for you better than God? Have you ever, uh, I don't know how long this takes to happen in a person's life, but ever, have you ever thought, well, this is what I want. This is what I need. There are two differences, but either way, for my point. And you pray to God about it. Well, I hope you remember that part of that prayer says, not my will, but thine be done. And why do you put that there besides the Bible instructing you to do it? Because God. God knows better about what you need than you do. Now that shouldn't be that hard to understand because children come to their parents all the time wanting something. And they think probably it's really a need. When you know better, it's not. Or they think they want to go this direction in a given situation and you know it's not the best thing for them. Now to use the approach Jesus did in showing the point I want to make. If you, being the weak, fallible parent you are, can know what's best for your children, how much more so does our Father in Heaven know what to give us or what to withhold from us? Because He knows we want to go to Heaven. And that just wouldn't be good for me right now and view my ultimate goal. I see that in Christ, don't you? We pointed it out over and over again. In the garden. Knowing what was just a little while away from him. Father, if it be possible, let this cup pass from me. Nevertheless, not my will, but thine be done. Now you remember that during his earthly ministry, he said, to this end was I born. He told them, that is his apostles, when they were going up to Jerusalem, here's what's going to happen to me when I get there. And yet in the garden, he prayed, if it be possible. Folks, it wasn't possible. And sometimes we pray certain things. Yet down deep in our heart that God knows we want to be in heaven with him. We want to obey him. We want to live the Christian life. So we pray that this happens. And God who knows all things says, not possible, won't be good for you. And many times we live a few years longer or less time than that. And we say, well, I'm glad that didn't happen. Aren't you glad God already knew it'd be best if it didn't happen? And he knew better how to answer your prayer than what you thought for yourself. 
While he was dying upon the cross, our Lord prayed. Luke 23, 34 through 46. <clears throat> well, I don't know of a better time to pray than just before you enter into his presence, literally and actually. But notice also that in his prayers, he didn't just pray for himself. While he was on that cross, he prayed, Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. And of course, later on when the gospel was preached on the day of Pentecost, and Peter charged him with having taken him with wicked hands and crucified the Son of God. And as they were pricked in the heart and cried out, Men and brethren, what shall we do? Then they received the answer to Christ's prayer. For as believers, they were told to repent and be baptized, every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ, for the remission of sins. And Christ's prayer was answered. Everyone that gladly received his word and were baptized, Acts 2.41. And the Lord added to the church daily, such as should be saved, Acts 2, 47. It all fits. It always will fit. And if you'll study it, you'll see where the pieces of the puzzle goes. If you will rightly divide the word of truth, 2 Timothy 2, 15. Let me mention something before I close about the early church. That is the church of which we read of in our New Testament. Because it was exceedingly strong in prayer and thanksgiving. If you will notice, there on the day the church started, it is said of the 3,000 who had been added to the church, Luke by inspiration records it, and they continued steadfastly in prayers, among other things, Acts 2, 41 42, steadfastly. It wasn't hit or miss. It was planned out. Because you see, even that should be done decently and in order. When Paul was kept in prison by Herod, prayer was made earnestly, by the church unto God for him. Acts 12 and verse 5. I should say Peter. Although they're both pretty good examples of prayer. <laughs> the churches were admonished to pray. To the saints in Rome, con continuing steadfastly in prayer. Romans 12, 12. To the church of our Lord in the city of Corinth in Greece, give yourselves unto prayer. 1 Corinthians 7, 5. To the saints and the faithful in Christ in Ephesus of Asia with all prayer and supplication, praying at all seasons in the Spirit and watching thereunto in all perseverance and supplication for all the saints. Ephesians 6, verse 18. To the church at Philippi, in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known unto God. Philippians 4, 6. To the saints and faithful brethren in Christ in Colossae, continue steadfastly in prayer, watching therein with thanksgiving, Colossians 4.2. To the church of the Thessalonians, pray without ceasing, and everything give thanks, for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus to you. Word. 1 Thessalonians 5.17 and 18, which we've already touched on. Now a question to us who make up the congregation of the Lord here at Spring. If he were writing a letter to us about prayer, do you think he'd say the same thing? Well, of course he would. This being the New Testament, the last will and testament of Christ, where the Lord manifests his authority for us to live and walk the straight and narrow way, then he would say the same thing. And he did say it in the sense it's a part of the New Testament. The last three of the passages I just noted shows the very close interrelation of prayer and thanksgiving. I really already touched on that, but I want to emphasize that point. We always need to be mindful that every good gift and every perfect gift is from above, coming down from the Father of lights in whom there is no variable, it's neither shadow of turning, James 1.17. To receive these blessings from God without ever thanking Him is to basically live on the level of hogs which eat the acres under the trees, not ever looking up. I'm afraid there are a lot of people like that, I hate to say. Jesus set the great and good pattern or example of giving thanks for our necessary things, such as food. In feeding the 4,000, he prayed, Mark 8, 6. And also in feeding the 5,000, John 6, verse 11. Notice that he first gave thanks and then the eight. A feeling, a thought, an attitude of dependence upon God 
and of gratitude to him. It will cause us to do the same thing. But I wonder how many people just sit down and start shoveling it in with no thought about pausing to thank their God. And we sometimes put this in too. As we ask God to receive our thanksgiving for this food and bless the hands that have prepared it. And that's a marvelous thing. Because in the process of God giving us this food, most of us, somebody prepared it. And in the normal home, usually that's mama. In some cases it's not. Somebody prepared it for us. Shouldn't we be thankful? I end with this little story. I may have told it before. I'm getting old enough to where I can say that. And even if I didn't make any difference, I'll tell it again because it makes a great point. An elderly woman in long years gone by had very little food. In fact, she didn't have any. We forget about that there were days like that. In the days of maybe some of our grandparents and great-grandparents, there were, there were people who actually struggled to find anything to eat, especially in the bottom of the Great Depression. And there are people in the world like that today, living right now, who have a hard time knowing where tomorrow's food is going to come from if they had some today. Well, she was praying. Praying for God to give her food. She was earnestly praying. Fervently praying. And a couple old country boys, and back in those days they looked for everything they could to have some sort of uh, adventure, right or wrong or <coughs> cruel or whatever. And they heard her praying through the window. You know, they didn't have air conditioning in those days. Believe it or not, there's something to be thankful for, especially in Houston. And I mean that seriously. <laughs> So they heard her, and they slipped off, was able to round up groceries. The story goes, they got back, she was still praying. They slipped in and set all those groceries on the table, and they left. They went back outside the window, and they waited. And finally, she ended her prayer. She raised up, and there were all the groceries. She looked at him for a minute. She bowed humbly and continued to pray. Father, thank thee for this food thou hast abundantly supplied thee, even if you use two devils to send it. <laughs> now, there's a good laughable point in that. But God used the devil. The devil didn't know it. To perform the greatest thing in the world that could ever happen for us. He used him to cause the death of the precious Son of God. And by dying, he supplied salvation to every one of us. That's the God we serve. It ought to make us more fervent and desirous. Because death to the one outside of Christ or the atheist or the pagan who has no knowledge of what the Bible truly teaches about death and what lies beyond. And so many secularists in the United States will give it a thought. They try not to think about it. Or if they do, to them it just all ends right here. And you go into some sort of unconsciousness. So you don't worry about heaven or hell or anything else. We ought to realize we have told us in the Bible what lies ahead for us if we're faithful. I've often thought one of the greatest things in the world would be to die while you're praying. Or be to die while you're reading your Bible. Or be to die while you're preaching. We don't always get our druthers, do we? There's no telling how we'll depart this life. But it doesn't make any difference if we're faithful. It doesn't make any difference if you're faithful. Now, the question you have to ask yourself in all honesty, because God knows your heart, folks. You can't hide it from Him. Are you a member of the church of our Lord? Are you a Christian? Because only those who are members of the church Jesus built and purchased with his blood are Christians. Because he adds every one of them to that church and nowhere else. That's his family. He only has children in his family. That's his body and they're only members of that body. These are the saved. You can pray and you ought to pray. We ought to all do better at our praying and our Bible study. Because if you're outside of Christ, you're lost. I don't like that. I know God doesn't because of what he gave to make it possible for you to be saved. But you must believe that Christ is the Son of God. Repent of your sins, confess your faith in Him, and be baptized for the remission of your sins. Or you'll forever stay outside of Christ and be lost. 
As a child of God, are you willing, if you see sin in your life, to truly repent, confess those sins if they're private only to God, and ask His great mercy to forgive you? And if you brought reproach on the blood-bought body of Christ by your conduct, are you willing to confess that you sinned before the church and ask for the church to pray for you and with you for forgiveness of sins? Why wouldn't we? We all started down this road admitting we needed Christ and the gospel and humbled ourselves and obeyed the truth. So why wouldn't we continue to be humble and meek and lowly and receive with meekness the engrafted word which is able to save our souls? So if you're subject to the great and marvelous invitation of our Savior, Jesus Christ, we invite you to come while we stand and sing.